All right, guys, whatever you want, go ahead. How's everybody looked? Now that you got them back on the field after the summer. Yeah, you know, I, again, I, I would say this team, veteran leadership, has had a really good summer. And so, you know, we're a healthy football team going into the start of fall camp, which is, I think, what you want to see. You know, it's a group that fundamentally and physically, I feel like, has really taken advantage of everything from January to obviously where we are now. And you're talking a starting point today. But, uh, you know, at least from what I saw, is a, a very eager football team to get ready to go. Matt, the state of Iowa is a hot spot again. Um, I've heard on the street that you guys, your football program is over 90%. Can you go into that a little bit? And are you guys going to be under the same protocols that you were under last year? And you know, just you, you guys internally? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's ever changing. And so I think we're trying to adapt with obviously what's going on around us, what the NCA guidelines are. Um, fortunately, you know, Mark Copley has done a great job mm -hmm. from last year to where we are at this point. Um, but like you said, I, I, from a from a standpoint of our guys being vaccinated, um, you know, we're well over 90% of our team and, you know, hopefully really close to 100% by the time we actually start the football season. So um, all things that we just continue to try to educate our, obviously ourselves on, and then once we can educate ourselves, try to educate our kids on. Is there anything you can say publicly to those players that aren't vaccinated? I, I, I know. Maybe it's not players. Maybe it's somebody, Secretary of Health or whatever. I yeah, I, I, again, I, I really think all you can do is, is continue to try to take the guidelines and the education yeah. that we're given and and continue to try to make the best decision for everybody involved. One more thing on that, on that strange thing. <laughs> but um, Volpe was very outspoken on this whole thing. He actually started his press conference regarding it a couple of weeks ago, last time I talked to you. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, there's no more, there's no more, you know, passes there's no more passes no more cancellations no more postponements it's a, it's a forfeit what is your thoughts on that yeah I, again I, I from my end of it all we can continue to try to do is do a great job internally of taking care of what we can control and you know I, I think from from that standpoint this program and our kids have proven that they can do a great job of that um, and, and we'll continue to you know we're battling a lot of things on a lot of different fronts and so I think that's Part of our job as teachers and educators is to just continue to do a great job of educating our kids, our team, on you know what can put us in a position to maybe not play our best football or not give us an opportunity to be our best when our best is needed. And so, um, yeah, I think continue to educate from all right, all right. Um, so you're asking your kids, I mean, you, not you, coaches everywhere are asking their their, their student athletes to two years in a row now, not just you, everybody not to do the social things that go along with, with college. That's a, that's a heck of a, seems to me like, a heck of a um, something to give up, no? Yeah, and, and I think when you look at, number one, you look at the situation that our kids have been in, let, let's not even think about the social situation, mm -hmm. man. We're, we're getting ready to go back to school, and you know we really have a redshirt freshman group um, and a freshman group that really hasn't gone into a classroom for the last two years. And, you know, whether that's their last year of high school or their first year here at Iowa State. So, you know, I, I, I think we forecasted this in January as we came back into, you know, this football season. I, I would argue that this football season as a coach and as a football team may be one of the most daunting and challenging uh, seasons that we'll ever face. You know, last year, man, the rules were the rules and everybody was in a quarantine situation. And so everybody had to kind of follow the guidelines. And now, you know, it becomes personal choice. and. You know, what choices you make, I think what we did learn a year ago, the choices you make on the field and off the field dictate who you become on the football field. So, um, again, educational opportunities and opportunities for us to continue to understand and educate. Okay. Uh, you mentioned controlling the things you can control. I guess what's the mindset or how do you guys approach the things you can't? Is it something that you think about or talk about with the team or, I mean, COVID or anything else, sure. you know, generally? Yeah, and, and, I, and I do think if you guys have known myself, our staff, and I think our kids would say the same thing, man, we have a lot of open forum discussions on everything that's going on around us. And, you know, I try not to hide anything from our team. And, you know, because I think the best way to be able to get through anything is communication. And, you know, I think our communication is really strong. Um, you know, it's, it's great to have great leadership to continue to carry that conversation, obviously, far past the coach player conversation, but then the player to player conversation as well. So, you know, everything is usually on the table and all those are things we, we kind of have an open forum with. In Dallas, you got asked about why you're still at Iowa State. Mm -hmm. My question is, are you surprised that people continue to be surprised that you're here? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I probably put zero thought into it, to be honest with you. You know, I, I, I think I, that's something I learned a long time ago as a, as a, you know, at the University of Toledo and maybe as a young coach, maybe didn't handle those things as well. Um, and I think that's just part of growth. You know, you, sometimes you worry about things that other people say, the media says, people around the program say, and those are things you can't control. I think all you can do is control your actions, your accountability, and, and then hope your, your actions speak louder than your words. What do you think people misunderstand about either you or the situation you're in that leads them to, to be surprised? Yeah, and, and I, I don't know. You know, I think you guys probably know me well enough to be able to answer that, that question probably better from your perspective than my perspective. I, I think all the only thing that I really put my time and effort into is, man, how do I get our coaches better? How do I get myself better? And then obviously, how do I get our kids better? And yeah, you know, it's really where I put the majority of my time. Some housekeeping stuff. Uh, everybody report back scholarship wise, and then anyone kind of starting out a little slow behind the with time for like injuries or whatnot. No, I you know I think we're in a really good spot right now. I, again, from a he overall health standpoint, you know we couldn't be in a better place to start the football season. And so um, again, a lot of credit goes to our kids. A lot of credit goes to Coach Andrews, and, and certainly a lot of credit goes to our tra athletic training staff. But you know, our, our priority really since January on is, man, can we get the full strength? Can we get the full health? And then can we maximize the time that we have from January till right now to put ourselves in the best position to be successful? And so far, our kids have done a great job of that. Um, last year, you had PJ Tampa switch positions when he arrived. Anything like that with the freshman class or anybody coming back that you're looking at elsewhere? Yeah, uh, good question. I, you know, right now, no. I, I think right now, I feel really confident about where everybody's starting point is. Um, you know, that's probably a really good question to ask me in two weeks because, you know, we'll, we'll talk every night about every position group and every player on our football team. And, you know, again, my job and responsibility is how to, obviously, I help our team be the best we can be, but how do I also help every player on our team be in the best position to get on the football field? And, you know, those are things we work really hard at. And so I think, again, a really good question for two weeks. But right now, everybody's starting where they started at least at the end of the season. How much growth has I was going to say, how much growth have you been able to ascertain, you and your staff, Coach Andrews, this summer versus last, where there's differences but a lot of similarities, too, in terms of what you're able to do? And yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I would say a transformational from January to where we are now, everything's been totally different. Um, we've never done any of the things that we, we have done in our program, at least operationally, from how do we get to be our best in the 12 guaranteed opportunities we have. And, you know, we learned a lot of last year for from a COVID situation. We learned a lot of last year of, man, how do you reflect from that? I think we came back in January on a mission to define what did we learn and how can we take that and grow. And, man, I, I really, from what we did in spring, from a spring practice model to what we did to a summer model, I, I think we learned a lot a year ago and, and really tried to put it for the best interest of our kids to maximize their full potential. What does that, what does that mean necessarily? Is that mean less hitting maybe day to day? Or like, how do you approach that, I guess, now going into camp? Well, you know, I, I think a year ago, obviously, we, we learned when you were had such a short time frame to get ready for the season and you had three months off that, gosh, if you didn't have your players available, then you probably were going to be at a huge disadvantage. And the reality, that's that is college football, right? In, in, in a normal year or not a normal year like we had a year ago. So that doesn't mean less hitting. I think it just means understanding, gosh, what does every period give you within the rules give you an opportunity to do? Um, bigger, faster, stronger in the off season. How do you maximize that value system? Fundamentals and technical work, man, in the spring football model, how do you maximize that? How do you carry both of those into the summer? And then when you get the opportunity to actually put a helmet on, be out there with a football with your team, then how do you grow into that and make sure that those days and opportunities are maximized? And I, I, again, we have such little time. You know, professionally, you, man, you get, you get so much time to work on all those things on a professional model where in the collegiate model, due to the rules and regulations, you just don't. And so, you know, I think we still have two very big pillars, bigger, faster, stronger, and then the fundamental technical and schematical piece that we got to try to merge together to be our best. And really, that's kind of what our time frame has been around is how do we unveil a model that is maximizes all those. Have you seen Hunter and Aiden grow since they got here? Oh, you know, I, I think anytime you're a quarterback, and especially you talk about, you know, Hunter's situation where he got live game reps, Aiden situation where, you know, just continuing to take really good practice reps a year ago. 
I still think it gives you confidence. And, you know, systematically, we haven't changed. I think we continue to evolve, but haven't changed. So I think anytime that happens, there's a confidence to get in the huddle, to call a play, to get up to the line of scrimmage. And now it's not just am I calling the play right, but now I can look across the ball and say, man, what's the defense doing? Can I start to anticipate where the football needs to go or what decision needs to be made? And so I, I would probably just say anticipation is great growth of what I've seen even from where we were a year ago to where we are today. What's Oklahoma and Texas leaving for the SEC mean for Iowa State in the big picture in the long term? Yeah, again, I, I have no idea. You know, I, I think those are things. Great question, probably a better question for somebody else here because, you know, my, my focus has been on zero that, you know, and to say it doesn't matter or I don't care is probably wrong, but to say that I've thought once about it is, is probably right. You know, my focus has solely been on our kids and our football team and making sure, you know, we continue to do what we need to do in the present. Matt, we've been watching a lot of Olympics. Just Simone Biles thing has been a huge story. Is there anything specifically that you guys do around your program to make sure the mental health of these guys is in is in the right spot, especially given what we've dealt with the last year? Boy, I, I mean, and, and not even the last year. You know, I, I think over the last three to four years, if you weren't thinking about mental health, if you weren't thinking that what 18 to 22-year-old student athletes, especially, you know, at the level and the expectations that are put upon them, um, then I think you're missing the boat. And so, you know, those are things that we have poured our time, our effort, our energy, and continue to bring in different resources to educate ourselves as the teachers so we can be an asset to help guide our players, but then also bring in those, those assets to our players to help them uncover what is great mental health, what does it mean to handle with pressure and handle all these things that are coming at 18 to 22 year olds. And, you know, uh, I, that wasn't just a last year thing, but I think that helped us navigate the storm of, of really what we've been in since, you know, last, last March. So um, great question. I think something that is obviously very real and something that if you're a teacher today, it doesn't matter if you're teaching sports or teaching, you know, in education. Uh, it should definitely be priority number one. Does that mean that, like professional people coming in to, to speak with guys and things like that? Yeah, and I, I think again, first of all, you got to educate the coaches. You know, what's the awareness of it? How do you handle this? How do you help your kids handle it? And then educating the players on what is this and how to handle it. So I think multiple resources that we have reached out to, that we have brought into our football program to try to really help guide us. She said that Biles did that. That one of the uh, concepts here, or one of the factors here, is that everyone expects her to be great. Everyone tells her how good she is all the time. I don't know how comparable they are, but obviously we know where this program's going to kind of start the season. Does that play a factor at all when you have uh, us, national media, that are going to be saying, hey, this team's going to be really good, supposed to be really good, and everything that kind of comes along with that? You know, I, I think that's such a great question, and I think that's really a question that I wish you had asked me two years ago because I would tell you I probably did a really poor job two years ago when maybe this started to, to come, right? You know, we I think after the, you know, we played in the Alamo Bowl um, that following season in 19, I, I, I really look back on that 19 season and say, man, I, I, I don't know if I was good enough in addressing expectation, standard. Man, you had some young players that were forced upon expectation, and then you had some older players. And, you know, I think it took the ability for me to sit down and talk to our kids to understand maybe where some of my shortcomings were as the head football coach. How do I address it and, and really then have even more awareness to say, gosh, we got to be better and it's got to start with the head football coach. So, you know, I, I think those are things that we learned two years ago that have helped guide us. And, you know, like I, I sit down and we just didn't get good and expectations didn't just happen. Like we've been really good here for the last four years. So, you know, I, I think there there has been a growth process in understanding that. And, you know, especially at a place like Iowa State where success hasn't occurred with great uh, consistency and all of a sudden you start to kind of move up that ladder, uh, you do feel that from a coach standpoint, from a player standpoint, and I think everybody. And, you know, I think I've been able to evolve with, as our program's evolved, you know, understanding the value that that, what you just said really is real and how can I do a better job of protecting, guiding, and educating our kids. What would you have done differently two years ago and how does that affect you today? Yeah, I, I, I think it's just, you know, falling back on what our core values have been, relationship, culture, the best interest in of our football team is still the 18 to 22 year olds. And, you know, and then also, you know, with our coaching staff, you know, I, I, I think sometimes my greatest fault is, you know, you're talking about a guy that worked up from division three football and a staff that's worked up from division three football. And sometimes a lot of time our motto has been, man, if you work harder, 
then you know you're going to be better and so at some point i think there's a realistic piece and you guys probably have done this in your own profession man at at a point can i work smarter and understand what's evolving around me and be better for the situation that i'm currently in and so you know that doesn't mean we've worked any less or not worked to the standard that has been what we, what's allowed us to be successful but i think working smarter i think defining who we are defining man again we set the standard and expectation for who we are, not the outside noise, and and really kind of honing in on those things. You know, it probably escaped me a little bit in 19, and you know, I, I probably did a really poor job to be honest with you. Aside from Charlie Kohler, who Mauser says is shredded, and and Skip Beckwith. That's a who, loose term, shredded. <laughs> I didn't even know what it meant. Yeah, yeah, I don't either, but anyway, I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's one of those things you, you're down for. Yeah. So you need to check that one out. Yeah. Anyway, who are we? See Monday and say, "Oh wow, good to know." Yeah, I, I, I think the group that I'd probably talk about the most is the group that maybe had the most to gain, right? And that's that group of guys that decided to come back to Iowa State. And you know, I, I think any time that that happens, you have some guys that either could have left for professional opportunities, or could have left from you know the the COVID situation where we, where they got an extra year. I think that's always a fine line. You know, I think the fans and the media say, "Man, that's awesome! Those guys came back." I think the coach, there's a hesitation of, man, are you coming back with the right mindset and the right purpose? A team is very important, but can you push yourself to maximize this opportunity? You said that phrase. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I think from my end of things, that's probably, if I'm really proud of one group, boy, that, that, that senior class, those guys that decide to come back, there's not a guy that failed in terms of maximizing what the last seven to eight months have given them. And so I, I think it starts there. And to be honest with you, if it does start there, then it bleeds through the rest of the program. It bleeds through the young freshmen and sophomore and juniors that say, hey, if they're working like this, then that's the expectation and standard of what the work ethic needs to look like. And I'm not just talking in the weight room, but how you sleep, how you recover, how you take, how you do nutrition, you know, all those little things that actually matter as much as man going out and playing the sport of football. So um, I, I, I would just say, just in general, that group all has done a phenomenal job really changing what their body looked like in January to what they look like today. Matt, you talked about Brock at Big 12 Media Days about how there was a point last year where you kind of saw that he was playing like that freshman year, Brock, again, with that passion. I guess, you know, if you, he came back yesterday, I mean, what's it going to take for you to see, you know, that, I guess, same fire once the season begins so you won't have to, you know, kind of transform, you know, halfway through the season? Yeah, and I don't think you ever have to worry about Brock Purdy and passion. Uh, Brock Purdy probably exudes passion. I think the thing that I saw in Brock in terms of last year is, you know, kind of what we're talking about a little bit is, man, you're, you're, you, you want to be so great, so bad that you, that you sometimes are, you paralyze yourself because you don't want to screw it up. And I think what I saw Brock really do a great job in November is say, hey, listen, number one, I don't have to do everything anymore. I can. You know, I, all I got to do is do my job, my responsibility, and do a great job of it. And if I do that, we're going to be a really good football team. And, you know, I'm really proud of Brock. I think, you know, you, you almost saw a weight lifted off his shoulders. And, you know, sometimes you have to hit, you know, a little bit of rock bottom situationally. And it's the rock bottom situation is, hey, there's three turnovers in the first half of the Baylor game. You know, how do you respond to that? And, you know, I think that showed everything about who Brock Purdy is and then really what he did from there on, I, I mean, is, is – borderline incredible and I would equally say before that Brock Purdy played really really good football it's just from my end that enjoyment level and that almost that breath of I can I can go play football again and not have to feel like I have to be perfect every time um, it was really fun to watch that do you feel like that was something and he's just talking about mental health do you feel like that was something that was kind of weighing on not just Brock but a lot of guys last year where they had a weight lifted off their shoulders at a point no, I, I don't think last year. I think I, I go back to 19, you know, and, and, and to me, I think, and I'm talking of myself included, you know, I, I think you are, you paralyze yourself because you want to be so perfect, so bad for the players on this team because of what they've sacrificed and what they've done. And yet we play a sport that's imperfect. It's never going to be perfect. No game will be perfect. No situation will be perfect. How we respond to it and prepare for it, we can, we can handle. But you know, we know and realize that. And I think just defining that, understanding that, have a global conversa conversation about those things, I think that's helped all of us, myself, our coaches, and certainly our players. But the guys who are coming back that you mentioned, you know, the boy guys with the Charlie Kohler, how magnified is that importance of their role as leaders 
I mean, you, you know, so much was mandatory last season, a lot voluntary this year, yeah. and making themselves heard and kind of leading the way. In, in mandatory in terms of <laughs> public perspective and maybe what the rules were, yeah. but still by choice, yeah. right? Yeah. Because when you are an 18 to 22 year old and you leave the two hour block yeah. in the football <laughs> facility, you can do whatever you want, right? Yeah. It's still a free country and you can do whatever you choose to do. Yeah. And so again, that's where the leadership was huge a year ago. And that's where I would hope that the leadership will continue to say, hey, here's what we learned from last year. Mm -hmm. Here's what's out there. Here's the challenges. Here's what the expectations are. It's as much as we, we as coaches want to think it matters what we say, it does matter to a point. But there's a point where they quit listening and then it's got to be their peers demanding the standard and expectation. And it, it's why I've said Iowa State football will always be better the older it is and especially the older it is with, with really good leadership at the top end of it. And we're fortunate that we've got great player leadership right now. You mentioned Brock uh, knowing that he doesn't have to do anything or do everything, excuse me. And I think immediately our minds go to Xavier and Breach and Charlie, but does that really start up front with those five guys of just saying, Brock, you drop back to your progressions and we'll give you time and space? I would say 100%. You know, I, I think where where was our greatest growth last football season? It wasn't did Brock Purdy play better or worse? Did Brees Hall play? Man, they, they've, they've played really good football before that. It's that offensive line taking a huge step forward. And now can you take another step forward? Because I still think there's another step out, out there for that group to continue to grow. And, um, you know, one of the great positives there is there's competition. Um, man, you better bring it every day or you, you might not play, you know. And so I think when those things occur, you know, and I think we were able to generate that and get that maybe a little bit earlier in some other positions. And I know I've said this, I, I, there's going to be never be a quick fix for that at Iowa State. You know, you can't just go, you know, get an instant answer at the offensive line position. It takes recruiting, development, and time. And I think if we, we've studied football, we know, man, that's three to four years. You're asking an 18-year-old 18, 18 offensive lineman to go block a 22-year-old, you know, man in there. Man, that's that's growth, and and really, I think we're at that point where we continue to hopefully evolve and grow, and we've got depth, and we've got numbers, and we've got classes behind classes that continue to understand what the standard is up front and grow, kind of like what we've been able to do on the defensive line at times. How many guys do you have at that position now that you feel comfortable with, and compare that to maybe when you guys first got there? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say as we go into camp, there's 11 guys that I feel like could start right now on our football team now. You know, we'll see if they still feel that way, you know, two weeks from now. But I think they're guys that through, you know, what we saw last year during during the season, what we saw, you know, last year through, you know, their growth process and practice to what have they done in the weight room to where are they right now? You know, man, I, I'd say there's 11 guys that I feel really comfortable with that could or have the ability to start on our football team. And, you know, we're, we're excited about some of those young guys. I'm not even adding up into that group yet. So. Um, I, st I think a lot of depth, and again, I still think that group's got to handle the same thing. Hey, people think you're somewhat good now. You know, that group hasn't had to handle that. How do you handle success? How do you handle playing good in some moments? Hopefully they're, they're smart enough to turn the videotape on in some of those moments they didn't play good because our team didn't play good. But, you know, I think the reality of it is, is you know, where does that group want to take our football program? But those, I'd say 11 is the answer for me. How important is it then to have guys like Colin and Trevor that have played so many snaps for you that can kind of be cornerstones? Yeah, I, I, I think big, obviously. I think the guys that have taken those snaps and, you know, I, I think also guys that have had to deal with injury and have had to deal with adversity and have had to deal with some hard things too. I think that as much as playing is good because that that's probably going to happen. You know, we're going to probably have some guys that are going to have some of those things and work through those things. And so, you know, I think to have some guys that have some betterness to them and understand that, you know, man, it's not perfect or you might have a setback. How do you get through that and keep those numbers at 11 or 12? Then I think we'll, we'll continue to be the best version of us. And it's great to have two guys that not have just played, but man, really have gone through tough injuries. Have, we're the guy, we're the starter. And now you're not the guy or starter because, you know, five guys can play at a time. So, you know, what are those other six guys doing, you know, and can they be engaged and still be great teammates and be ready when their number's called? Are you still practicing like you've done in the past? I think you've done in the past. However many guys in the morning and then bring, you know, the next, the next group of guys at night? Or? We, you, actually, we did that all through spring. Um, okay. You know, we, we practiced two practices a day all through spring practice. 
um, you know, with the mindset to prepare ourselves mm -hmm. to when we got to, you know, these team situations and these, you know, global situations where we can really be out there with our football team that we can have that. Now we still have those two teams and we use that within a singular practice, but having two separate practices, that was kind of our so spring So you've got mind. 125, 150, whatever, over there now? 118. How many? 118. <laughs> Did you have 118 out there on the field? We had. Like this time last year together? Yeah. At what point did you have 118? Yeah, you know, gosh, I, <laughs> probably a week and a half before our first game, you know. And so I, I, I think, again, you're, you're talking last year, you know, yeah. s such different circumstances. And, you know, I think even at that point last year, we we're in the mode of, man, are we playing or are we not, right. you know. Yeah. But um, that part's nice to be at least having 118 guys with a plan and understanding where we're going. How have your guys handled NIL and how do you want them to handle NIL as the season gets going here? Oh man, gosh, I feel like, are you, I wonder if you're like asking for a good sound bite here or not. Like, uh, you know, really, and I do think that's a huge positive for us. It's another educational piece. Um, I think our guys have done a phenomenal job handling it. You know, as I told our players, you know, it's not like they gave a name, image, and likeness and gave you four extra hours in the day to say, hey, listen, let's go get good at education. Let's go get really good at our sport. And then, hey, oh, by the way, let's take the extra four hours and go get better at name, image, and likeness and make, you know, a little bit of money. So, you know, I think our guys have handled that. You know, my only ask is, you know, our, our thing here is, man, um, the image of one projects the image of all, right? And so, you know, how you use your name, image, and likeness, how you carry yourself in this community, how you act, it's about all of us. It's not just about a singular person. But, you know, the guys that have been able to, to be able to use that in a positive way, it's been really good. And, you know, I, Randy, t I think, talked about the Rory Walling situation where, man, using that to make a difference. And I, I do think that's the one thing that our kids do understand. And, and, and again, something else we talk a lot about in our program is give more of yourself than you take from the whole. And, you know, I, I really feel like our kids understand that value system um, and, and have really done a great job with name, image, and likeness. How could it affect your team in a negative way? How can it affect it in a positive way? And I really think at, at this point, it's all been positive. Based on what you said earlier, it sounds like you have a small number of unvaccinated guys and that you hope that number gets even smaller. What are you hearing from those guys about what maybe is changing their mind to get it or what's the hesitancy for you? Yeah, I, I, again, I think every, every one of those situations are a little bit different, but you know, whether it's family value, whether it's health concern, um, you know, I think there's a lot of different reasons. And again, that's, that's personal choice too. And so, you know, giving our kids the opportunity to make the best decision for them and their family, it's ultimately their responsibility to that. And my responsibility is to help continue to provide, man, here's the facts, here's what we know. Um, and then you make the best decision for you and your family. You talked about Colin Newell earlier. Uh, what unique perspective does he provide you of being an Ames kid, having grown up watching games in the stands? Yeah. You know, I, I think that's always been one thing that's allowed Colin to really get off to a great start in our program early on is because there was such a pride factor of, man, this is really important for me to come here and help this program take a huge step forward. And Colin, from day one, has brought that kind of pride, that kind of energy, and that kind of commitment to our program. And now you see a young man that's engaged that's like, man, he's ready to graduate. He's been an uh, anchor to – the success of our football team. You couldn't ask for anything more from what Colin Newell has done on the football field, who he's been as a leader in our, our program, and, and really what he stands for for the Ames community. He's been, he's been nothing short of exceptional. I know you said you haven't really thought about the Texas and Oklahoma deal, but have you guys had conversations about when it comes to recruiting, I mean, the not knowing, the uncertainty of like what's going to happen for you guys, I guess. What's that been like for you guys inside the program? Again, I, you know, I've always said in the recruiting piece is win, right? When you win, people want to play for winners. And when you, when you want to have success, the, it, people want to be around a program that's having success. And I think winning not only on the football field, but then also winning in, man, how are you developing your student athletes? How are we helping them with life after football? How do we create an environment in, in that kids do feel confident and safe to come into your program? I think that matters way more than anything else matters, and, and I think sometimes we put too much thought into that, um, especially right now when, geez, it seems like it's a very cloudy environment and nobody really know, has any clear you know, vision of where this is going. So you know, the great thing is we control our own destiny. You know, we control who we are and where we go and what we become. So um, I think just really sinking back into those factors.
Yeah. Got time for one more question for Coach? You mentioned changing things in the spring and in the summer. When you look forward to fall camp now, what's going to be different when you think about obviously 2020 is different for 2019? Well, you know, I, I think the biggest thing from my end is, you know, understanding that we want to be our best on those 12 Saturdays, right? And, you know, I think my growth has come as, man, I could sit and practice for four hours and love it. Now, I don't think our kids would love practicing for four hours, and for their best interest to be better the next day, that's probably not the most wisest thing to do. And so I just think, again, having a global perspective of everything you do in your program from January till the end of December or January is the betterment of putting your kids in the best position to be their best on Saturday. What does that look like? How do we get there? Whether it's us as teachers or coaches or whether it's how we feed them, how we rest them, how we recover them, um, and how we practice them. So I, I think all those things fall on my shoulders. And, you know, I think just growth of, again, you 41 years old, like I don't have it all figured out, right? Like, so just trying to take what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, and continue to try to evolve to be the best we can be and help help myself and help our kids be the best version of myself that I can be for them. All right, Coach, thanks.